So I'm uh, Nick Bostrom, I'm the professor here at Oxford University and I direct the Future of Humanity Institute which is a multidisciplinary research centre uh, that tries to bring careful thinking to bear on the really big picture questions for humanity. So we're looking at things like are there threats to the very survival of the intelligent species? Are there ways in which future technologies could change the basic parameters of the human condition in some way? Um, what are the ethical uh, perspectives uh, from which we should evaluate such possible changes? Um, and also methodological questions, like how can you actually research these types of topics in, in a rigorous way? Um, yeah, it's actually a rip-off of an old a war poster that the British government used to circulate uh, during the Second World War. I think the original uh, message was keep calm and keep going. And it has that kind of quaint old feeling. Now, Andrew Sandberg dug this up um, a few months ago, or maybe a little bit longer, maybe a year ago. And we thought we could plug in X-Risk instead of keep going there. But since then it's become popular, this war poster. So you can see it in all shops now, there are coffee mugs with the same thing, keep calm and something. So it's no longer cool. Now it looks like we've just ripped off the latest kind of coffee mug in a coffee. So it's unfortunately, uh, we might have to take that down at some point because hmm. uh, it's become, become too popular. I mean, there is a serious point there, which is that with existential risk, what really needs to be done is not freaking out over it or being alarmist over it, but actually to take them seriously and try to understand what are the concrete steps that we can take that will best reduce existential risk. Well, an existential risk is one that endangers the survival of uh, earth originating intelligent life uh, or that threatens to permanently and drastically destroy our future potential for desirable development. So it's different from all the other kinds of um, uh, catastrophes that have happened many times through human history, even, even the worst horrors like world wars and famines and pandemics. They have been hugely destructive for the people who were immediately impacted by these, but they haven't, they haven't permanently destroyed our future. Whereas an existential catastrophe is different. It's uh, one that would destroy all future. So it wouldn't just be bad for the people who are alive at the time who might be killed by it, but if everybody goes extinct, then there is no future as well. So in terms of evaluating the significance of existential risk reduction, a lot depends on how you take into account the value of these future generations that could come to exist if we avoid an existential catastrophe. And since there is a lot more possible future than there is present, uh, if you count each person in the future equally as a present person, then it will tend to outweigh what's here right now. So the value of an existential risk is this potentially enormous number when you count all the people who could live on Earth for the next billion years, and then even more when you think of all the people who could live if our descendants colonized the universe. And uh, if, if we can realize experiences and lives in other substrate other than biology, if we can learn uploads and so forth, then even more. But, but even with the most conservative assumptions, even if you just assume human biological bodies living on Earth, no cosmic colonization, even then uh, the numbers are very, very large just because the Earth can remain habitable for hundreds of millions of years. Well, yeah, so it's not, it's not so much that we need to believe that Homo sapiens in its current form needs to be forever preserved. Uh, but it's more that we have this potential to realize a lot of value, either either by, by continuing to have a lot of humans or by having other kinds of sentient creatures, perhaps, that still embody what we think is of value. So different theories will disagree about what fundamental is of value, whether it's like pleasure or whether it's understanding and knowledge, interaction, relationships, creativity, whatever it is. Um, but all of those things could be realized by future civilizations to a far greater degree and over a far longer time span than we can currently realize these values. So, so that's why a lot of, for, for, for very many different plausible theories of value, there is just more potential value that could be brought into existence in the future than, than is currently realized here on Earth. 
um, and so hence the importance then of not destroying this potential. Well, in recent uh, couple of years, we've been focusing quite heavily on machine intelligence, partly because it it seems to uh, raise some significant existential risks down the road, partly also because relatively little attention has been given to this risk. So when we are prioritizing what we want to spend our time researching, then one variable that we take into account is how important is this topic that we could research. But another is how many other people are there who are already studying it? Because the more people are already studying it, the, the smaller the difference that having a few extra minds focus on that topic. So say the topic of um, peace and war and how you can try to avoid international conflict is a very important topic and many existential risks will be reduced if there is more global uh, cooperation. However, it's also hard to see how a very small group of people could make a substantial difference to the risk of arms races and wars. There are so big uh, interests involved in this and so many people already working either, either on sort of disarmament and peace and or on military strength that it's an area where it would be great to make a change but it's hard to make a change if you're a, a small number of people. By contrast with something like the risks from um, machine intelligence and the risk for super intelligence it's, it's only been a relatively small number of people have been thinking about this and, and there might be some low-hanging fruits there some insights that might make a big difference. Um, so that, that's one of the criteria. Now we are also looking at other existential risks and we are also looking at things other than existential risk. Like we try to get a better understanding of what humanity's situation is in the world. Um, and um, so we've been thinking some about um, sort of the Fermi paradox, for example, um, some methodological tools that you need, like observation selection theory, how you can reason about these things. Um, and to some extent, also more near term impacts of technology. And, and of course, the opportunities in, involved in all of this. It's, it's always worth to remind oneself that although enormous technological powers will create new dangers, including existential risks, they also, of course, uh, make it possible to achieve enormous amount of good. So one should bear in mind this, 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 this set of opportunities as well that, that are unleashed with technological advance. Yeah, there is no very good term that means the opposite of risk or catastrophe. So opportunity kind of is a little bit like the opposite of risk, but not exactly. But what's the opposite of a catastrophe, like a boon, a windfall? None of these terms really fit, which is interesting. I mean, it makes you wonder why it is that, that there are so many different words for the sort of sudden, unexpected downward movement, disaster, risk, catastrophe, cataclysm, um, but nothing corresponding to that in the upwards direction. If it is maybe because traditionally human society kind of constitutes a complex system and there are just many more ways of destroying it than of suddenly making it vastly better. It's not obvious whether that's the truth, the case, but, but possibly. I mean, if you think of a healthy human body, uh, there are many ways in which it could suddenly fail drastically. Like you get shot, you get stabbed, you get poisoned, you, you, you stumble from a cliff, you, you get sick. Uh, th there are hard, many fewer things that like could make a healthy human body suddenly vastly better. It just doesn't work like that. And may maybe similarly for human societies, there are more things that could suddenly destroy it, like some sort of revolution or war, or than then could take an already reasonably well-functioning sort of human society and catapult it to to a much higher level. But maybe with some of these new technologies, there are these potential for drastic improvements upward as well, in which case it would be useful to have a word for, for the opposite of, of catastrophe um, with some kind of human enhancement technologies, for instance. It, it might be that suddenly you could unleash the, 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 the potential for, for living kinds of lives that are just impossible when uh, you have our current biology.
Well, so with regard to human enhancement, it used to be very neglected up until the, nine, the late 90s by academia and the mainstream. So science fiction authors would explore it and, and people in the transhumanist community would be talking about these things. But in academia, there was very little public discussion about this. Now, that has changed so that uh, now it's a big part of bioethics, human enhancement ethics. There are books, um, seminars, papers, people working on these things. I think that's, that's some progress. I think what the field would most need right now is actually uh, human enhancement technologies that work. I think at the moment, the main thing that is holding us back is not so much that there are legal prohibitions on these things or ethical constraints, but just that there just isn't that much human enhancement technology that, that really would benefit a normal, healthy person. Um, in sport, we have things like steroids, which can increase strength, although they might have various health disadvantages as well. Um, but in terms of cognitive enhancement, there's very little there. I mean, there's like coffee, maybe it, it, it gives you a little bit of extra energy, but then probably you have to maybe sleep more the next day or morephanil. Some people might get a temporary boost in energy from that nicotine. These are on the margin and, and it might be that there are side effects and, and long term disadvantages outweigh the benefits you get. Um, and you can go through the other fields like mood. Can we enhance mood? Well, there are drugs that can enhance mood temporarily, but it's probably still not the very wise thing to do for somebody who wants to maximize happiness over a lifetime to start popping a lot of, of uh, legal or illegal drugs. There might be particular individuals who benefit if you have some natural imbalance of some neurotransmitter or something. But so, um, so I think that now we need maybe uh, the actual technology to catch up with some of these uh, discussions of human enhancement technology. And, and maybe we will see over the coming couple of decades, say, forms of genetic selection uh, that, that might produce genuine enhancement. And maybe there will be some drugs that can improve memory or provide other advantages. But it's just turned out to be, I think, more technically challenging than perhaps many people thought back in the 90s to quickly create medicine that provides real benefits in the real world uh, to ordinarily healthy people. So it's proven quite difficult to understand the full complexity of human biochemistry and the way we work down to the molecular level. We have a lot of information there, but, but often not the complete picture. There are so many indirect pathways by which one component can affect another that we always have to worry that even if we mapped out one causal pathway, there might be some indirect effect that we've not taken into account. So it's interesting, therefore, to figure out whether there are any ways of enhancing the system that doesn't rely on comprehensive understanding. And one of those ways would be through genetic selection, where you might be able to build up a database where you find out which kinds of alleles correlate with various traits. You don't necessarily have to understand how the allele cause those traits or how the different parts of the genome interact to create health or intelligence or whatever other trait you're interested in. But just by having the genomes of sufficiently many individuals and the outcomes, you, you can then find these correlations and you might then use that um, to select, for example, between some set of embryos if you are running in vitro fertilization um, or in the future maybe to do direct genetic engineering. Now, this technology is still at its infancy. It's only very recently that sequencing costs are coming down to the point where it is, well, now becoming feasible to run uh, large studies with many individuals and to scan their genomes, which you need to do to detect these often very small and weak correlations between particular alleles and trait outcomes. So it looks like for intelligence, for instance, that it's not determined by a few uh, genes, but that there are huge numbers of genes, each of which has a very, very small impact on intelligence. But because there are many of them cumulatively, it then accounts for the additive heritability of intelligence. And, and so to select for some trait like this, you would really need to know about a lot of 
correlations individually weak but uh, jointly strong but but that's the kind of thing that you could in principle do without understanding the full complexity of human biochemistry so my guess would be that um, perhaps the the first type of enhancement that will be really powerful will be these kinds of enhancements that you can do without having to understand exactly how they work. Well, so germline genetic enhancement has the disadvantage that it doesn't work for any of us because we've already uh, grown up, so it's too late. Um, but in terms of thinking about how enhancement technologies might actually have some impact in the world, uh, over the, say the next half century or so, then this might be one of the more powerful types of enhancement of the medical type. And they're all kind of external enhancements with, with computers and stuff that, that we use without having, without necessarily having to implant them in ourselves, but just this external infrastructure. Um, so I think that's one reason why it's in a sense less desirable. If you could have the same kind of enhancement either through germline or somatic gene therapy, it would be nicer if you could have it through somatic because then everybody could benefit from it. Um, also, with somatic gene therapy, you have the ability to ask for consent from the enhanced person. So an adult could make their own choice whether they want this enhancement or that or no enhancement at all. And, and that reduces a lot of ethical complications. Now, in the case of uh, the germline, you have to make decisions for some person who doesn't exist yet. So maybe parents would have to select which new person to bring into existence. And there are additional ethical complications in that that would be nice to be able to avoid. Yeah, so if if this kind of germline genetic enhancement technology starts kicking in, then there will presumably be an, an initial version of the technology that will be fairly weak, and then it will improve in its power over time. So that successive cohorts might then be increasingly enhanced, and, and you might have... Have, have a more rapid turnover than you have now. I mean, eventually we all get surpassed by our children because we, we sort of age and become senile and decrepit and then we die. Uh, but with in, in a regime where you have sort of new waves of genetic enhancement coming online every few years or every five or ten years, then, then you could have a kind of faster displacement that, that, that is the smartest people might always be quite young. So that would be a trade-off there. You still need some period to, to sort of grow up and mature and learn a field before you can start to contribute. But but maybe the, the, the strongest contributors will, will be in their sort of early 20s. or And then, then once you are sort of beyond 40, it's not so much that you have degenerated. You might still be able to do as good work as you ever did. But it's just by now, there might be a new cohort of, of more highly enhanced kids that have reached 20, that have sort of 20 years more advanced technology. And and that, that might be a... A big deal uh, once this ball starts rolling. Well, I think that with machine intelligence, there is a greater potential for a really explosive takeoff. That is, that once you reach machine intelligence that roughly match humans in general intelligence, as opposed to just domain-specific competence, then. I think it's a fairly good guess that soon thereafter, where soon might mean hours or weeks or a few years, that you will have super intelligence. So a machine intelligence takeoff could be very, very, very rapid. Now, with genetic enhancement, there is a kind of intrinsic delay because a human being still has to grow up and we have a generation span of 20 years or so. So it kind of modulates the impact. Also, there are more fundamental limits to what you can do with a biological brain. It still runs on the same kinds of neurons with the same, the, the, the same principles that our brains do, and that imposes speed limitations and size limitations and other kinds of limits that are not necessarily present for uh, machine intelligence. Um, so there's a greater potential for explosivity once you get to the machine intelligence enhancement. Now, in the medium term, there are concerns about how these different automation technologies might affect um, the social political landscapes for humans. Will there be technological unemployment, for example? And some economists are thinking that we might already see the early stages of that now. Um, in that there have been 
seemingly in, in a wide range of countries, increasing, increasing wage gaps between uh, educated workers and uneducated workers. One possible explanation for this is that automation has made it possible to more easily replace unskilled workers in, in kind of assembly in factories. You can have a little robot that puts the pieces together. Or in, in agriculture, you have big machines. You don't need so many individuals plucking the, the, the fruit. Uh, and in, in, in office automation, you, you don't need a very low skilled secretary who just types out things anymore. Like you have word processors, so like the boss can type his own thing. Um, it's possible that some of those trends might continue. Now, there are alternative explanations that have been put forward to this. One is outsourcing, that uh, a lot of the low skilled labor is now performed in low cost countries. So we see the wages of low skilled workers declining in, in the developed world. But it might be a combined effect from automation and sort of the new technologies for outsourcing. Um, so, so these are still issues that have not been fully resolved. What, what is the cause of the current increase in wage gap? And we don't know whether that, those will continue to unroll over the next few decades. But in the, in the limiting case, it, it, once we have sort of general um, machine intelligence, then a much wider range of human work becomes irrelevant, that you could have machines that can outperform us in every cognitive domain. And at that stage, uh, the only kinds of uh, jobs for which humans would still be competitive would be those where the customers have a particular preference that the job be carried out by human. So right now, a lot of people will play, pay extra money if, if some good has been made by hand, like a, a handmade a uh, little wooden doll might command a price premium over a machine made doll, even if the actual object is the same, because people might care for whatever reason about how it was produced, or if it were produced by indigenous people, or if, if, if the workers were treated ethically, that there might be all these kind of basic preferences we have in certain circumstances um, regarding the causal processes that produce the product we're buying. Uh, so in those areas, including some service areas where we might just prefer the service to be provided by a human being. Uh, it might be that humans could remain competitive even after machine intelligence can outperform us on all sort of objective metrics. In terms of um, what is most likely, uh, I think there are a range of scenarios that each have some claim to probability here. On the one hand, you have these rapid take of artificial general intelligence scenarios where you might have one entity that achieves super intelligence so quickly that for a period of time, it's the only super intelligence around. And it might thereby achieve a very powerful position such that it is able to form a singleton, that it is able to kind of shape um, the future. Uh, without having to worry about some competing agents. At the highest level of decision-making, there's kind of one decision-making process. Um, now, there is a very different class of scenarios where you have a multipolar outcome, uh, maybe in some scenarios involving whole brain emulation as the first type um, of machine intelligence to match human intelligence, modeled closely on human brains. In some of those scenarios, you might have a more gradual takeoff, in which case it's more likely that there will be many entities undergoing the takeoff simultaneously. Uh, and therefore, where there might not be any time where any one of them, where any one of these developers has a decisive strategic advantage where it can just dictate conditions. Now, it's very much not obvious at all which of these two classes of scenarios is most desirable. Naively, one might think it's dangerous if one entity has so much power that it can dictate the future. Let's hope that it's like a more pluralistic uh, takeoff scenario. But there are distinct kinds of failure modes that arise when you have many competing agents. You have, you have something like evolutionary competitive forces coming into play when you have many different entities that that are competing and it's there is no law of nature that says that evolution always has to lead to uh, desirable outcomes um, 
or even to to more complex and interesting outcomes it might be that the long run equilibrium of some kind of free for all competition between different cognitive processes like cognitive soup of different modules that get resolved and compete for resources it, it might be that although there would be a lot of productive capability in such a world that it might erode away the kinds of complex cognitive structures that we associate with consciousness that you might have all these kind of more primitive form of complex processes that trade with one another and outsource cognitive functionality into this cognitive soup and it's not at all obvious that the net result of that will be a, a world that we would place much value on even before that there is the possibility of if you have this kind of ecology of uploads that are competing for resources that that you will very quickly enter a Malthusian situation where the, uh, the average wages drop to subsistence level um, because it's very easy to produce more labor if labor is software you can just copy it and make more so the, the pool of labor expands until the wages that each upload can earn equals the cost of running an upload like paying whatever copyright fees you need to pay and electricity and hardware um, in which scenario like all humans can no longer earn uh, uh, an income if, if they are competing directly with uploads perhaps and possibly worse all these uploads that exist might then be living at subsistence level they might be working all day long and any minute they take off uh, for leisure that is not actually directly increasing their productivity it might just be the mean that they will be out competed in the next round of selections so you might have this kind of drift down to the lowest common denominator and that that could be a a dystopian future and uh, we don't know for sure whether that's what would happen in this multipolar outcome but it seems like a live possibility and it might be very difficult to avoid that if that's if that's what the fitness landscape looks like for these kind of upload ecologies then it might be very difficult to avoid that unless you have this unipolar outcome where you have one uh, singleton that is able to sort of uh, change the, the fitness function and on the other hand, of course, the unipolar outcome has risks of its own. Um, and I think that the first step to making progress on this issue is just to realize that they are very difficult. It's not at all obvious what the correct answer is. Well, with a, with a singleton, you have a wide range of possible outcomes because basically once you have a singleton, then the outcome will be whatever the singleton prefers. So the singleton has the ability to shape the future according to its values. That means the future will be shaped according to what the singleton wants. So depending on the values of the singleton, you could get anything. So extremely good outcomes that avoid all these dystopian competitive equilibria. And, and you could also get completely uh, valueless outcomes if, if you have a singleton that hasn't hasn't acquired human values in some sense. You could have a singleton whose only goal is to calculate more and more digits of uh, the decimal expansion of pi, uh, which is a completely meaningless goal by human standards, but there is no logical contradiction be ha between having a vast amount of intelligence and having a very simple goal, like just calculating the digits of pi. So one of the risks with this kind of rapid takeoff artificial intelligence uh, scenario is that we will fail to load human values into it and that we will end up with a super intelligent singleton that has some some humanly meaningless goal like making as many paper clips as possible or calculating digits of pi or something like that and then then the whole uh, future uh, and in fact the, the entire cosmic endowment like all the resources in the universe that we otherwise might one day have used for some beneficial purpose like building vast flourishing civilizations with extremely happy people living long lives in unbelie unbelievably wonderful circumstances, all that might then be used to just making more and more paper clips or making more and more of some other, in, in, by our lights, completely worthless thing. And it looks like a very difficult problem. It looks like a, uh, let me correct that, it looks like a potentially very difficult problem to figure out how to reliably load in values into a kind of seed AI. Uh, uh, in order that that value then remains stable and shapes the future of uh, the subsequent super intelligence in, in the way that we intended. It's at least as yet an unsolved problem. 
how to do that. So we have, in fact, with regard to artificial intelligence, two problems. We have first the problem of actually building artificial intelligence that reaches human intelligence and super intelligence, like it's a hugely difficult technical problem. And then we have this other problem of how to make sure uh, uh, that this, the, the super intelligence would have, would be safe. So like the control problem, how could you set up the initial conditions so that the outcome of an intelligence explosion would be something beneficial? So the technical problem of how to build AI and the control problem, both of these uh, will one day need to be solved, but it's really important that we get the solution to the control problem before we find the solution to the technical problem of how to build AI. Now, both of these problems look difficult. We don't know how long either of them will take to solve. Um, so what I'm thinking is that we need to start working hard on this control problem uh, so that we hopefully will have a solution available to that problem by the deadline, which is defined by whatever time people, some people find the solution to the technical problem of how to build an AI. No, that, 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 I think that, that's, that's, that's exactly right. I think that although some people have made very precise predictions about how far away we are from AI, uh, different people make different predictions. Um, and the truth is that nobody knows. It's just very, very difficult to predict with any reliability at all how long it will take to develop some radical new technology like AI. It, it seems that what we need is not just more grind, like more, you, you can't guarantee uh, the achievement of this goal but just by throwing more manpower or more money at the problem. There is one or more fundamental new insights that will probably be needed to create artificial general intelligence. And we don't know how hard those insights will be to get or exactly how many more insights are needed. So, so therefore, I think the bottom line is that we should think in terms of probability distributions rather than point predictions. And, and these probability distributions should be smeared out over a wide range of possible arrival dates. Could happen in, in 10 years, it could happen in 50 years, or 100 years, 200 years. We, we should accord some significant chance to each of those timeframes. It's, it, we are still at the very early stage here where there are a number of different types of research questions that could turn out to be relevant um, to the solving the control problem. And I think that at this early stage, we should pursue several different avenues. So one, one class of approaches has to do with figuring out the way by which uh, we can build AIs that can learn values um, and depending on some technicalities, there are sort of different methods of approaching that. So you could either try to give the AI initially some indirect or crude representation of the value. And then the learning process, um, consists of following that indirect process and or fleshing out those crude criteria. I mean, another form of value learning would be, uh, something more along the lines of what humans do, where we kind of accrete values over a lifetime, depending on what experiences we have. But there, one would have to be very careful that to, to, to set up the mechanism in such a way that it would actually accrete the same kinds of values that, that the human would accrete under similar circumstances. And it might be that our mechanism includes a lot of a genetically complicated machinery that makes us sort of generalize from experiences in certain ways. And if you had an AI that wasn't very similar to human mind, maybe it would generalize in different ways. And there would then be this risk that it might look like it was generalizing in the same way that we did when you tested it while it was still subhuman in intelligence or human level in intelligence. But once it kind of reached super intelligence, it, it might then be revealed that there were some differences in the kinds of values it had acquired. Uh, from the values that the human would have acquired, which could lead to catastrophe. Um, another approach is what I call the scaffolding approach, where you would have some preliminary values while the AI is weak, and you bring it up to roughly human level, where it can accumulate and learn human concepts in general, like we humans do, and then kind of freeze it and try to install a new, val a new goal system at that stage using these complex representations that it has acquired. Um, that has some 
pros and cons. Uh, I mean, one one possible disadvantage is the risk that it will sort of shoot past the mark and become too intelligent before we manage to install a new goal system. And, and there are some other. So the bottom line here is that there are several different approaches that we are just beginning to explore at this stage, and it's way too early to place any confident bet in which of these approaches to the control problem um, will ultimately prove most promising. Metaphors is, um, yeah, it's a, it's a risky business uh, in as much as a metaphor will usually have some properties that reflect what you really want to say, but then the metaphor might also have other features that don't actually match what you're talking about. So if you present the metaphor, people might might use the features you wanted of the metaphor, or they might do something different. I guess the very concept of the term intelligence explosion contains a kind of metaphor of an explosion, like something that happens very suddenly and that is potentially dangerous. I think that might be one of the reasons I like the term intelligence explosion more than the term singularity. Um, because it does have this connotation. And then maybe the secondary thought then will be that an explosion is potentially dangerous, but if you have a controlled detonation, you might be able to direct this power in some useful direction. Um, for most people, I think that a lot of their views about AI in particular and existential risks of other kinds in general are shaped to an unfortunately high degree by what they see in uh, science fiction novels and in movies made by Hollywood. Um, so this medium of science fiction has, has been very useful in, in one sense of kind of keeping these areas of thought alive for many decades before it became possible to study them in academia and sort of open people's minds. But there is also this good story bias that filter which kinds of stories we are exposed to that the scenarios that you will see in a Hollywood movie or, or a science fiction novel are all ones which made for a good story, an interesting story that's fun to watch or read about. So that usually means it's got to have protagonists that are recognizably humans, that have emotions, desires, that face some big challenge, that they have to interact with other human-like characters, and that the protagonists usually have some pivotal role to play in, in what happens, uh, that there is a set of um, ups and downs, um, as opposed to, for instance, the story where everything ticks along exactly as we are used to, and then suddenly uh, everybody goes extinct and nothing uh, arises to re replace us. There's like a really, really boring story. You, you, you couldn't have you couldn't really have a Hollywood movie where like everybody goes extinct in the first five minutes and then there's like nothing there. You can see plants growing and, but it might be that such a, such a story is much more likely than the story where some human protagonists uh, fight off a, a robot army using machine guns and where you have sort of the, the, the muscular human person and the nerdy human person and the sort of empathetic human person forming a team underground to sort of get around that like those kind of stories are much more interesting but much less probable so it's worth reflecting of how much of our intuitive expectations of what seems worth taking seriously uh, is just an artifact of this good story bias and then try to remove that so the less the less so the more boring a scenario is the, the more we should probably upgrade its probability to compensate for this I think that it'd be really great to, if we could raise our level of, of wisdom and rationality and also find better ways to coordinate and collaborate internationally. If we, if we had the coordination and the wisdom, um, then our chances would be vastly greater. I think that a lot of problems arise either from the fact that the world is splintered into different countries that might enter into arms races with one another are technology races where even if it would be better for everybody if the technology was discovered later each 
nation might think that if it's going to be discovered, it might as well be we who discovers it because it gives us power. And so there are these race situations. Um, and if we were also wiser, a lot of problems arise just from limited foresight, limited ability to think constructively about topics like synthetic biology and nanotechnology, not to mention artificial intelligence, which is just something that our political leadership and, and even our intellectual uh, sort of opinion formers are very ill-equipped to think seriously about. It, it requires, I think, a high level of intellectual well you really need to care about getting things right and, and even then it's quite difficult to do it but if if it's in an arena which, where the sort of discourse is shaped by a lot of other things than the quest for truth if, if people use the arena for political purposes or for self-promotion purposes or to tell interesting stories to make money and if there are all these other uh, sort of roles that are statements play then then like the truth is a very weak signal and it will be drowned out by this this kind of noise and distortion so yeah better cooperation and and better wisdom yeah i think would be kind of two general purpose resources that would just greatly enhance our prospects for a good future um in general terms now both of those are hard var like these are variables that although it's very like seems very clear that the sign of these is positive like it would be really great if we had more peace and cooperation and really great if we had more wisdom and understanding these are things that are hard to influence much for a small group so what you might then look for are either high leverage points where you could influence like if you could sort of seed some rationality culture or somehow design a new institution that would make people have wiser technology anticipations like prediction market is one of these i don't know whether it will actually be the one that that works but it's the kind of thing that it's an idea that if it really gives people a lot of other benefits in in sort of solving shorter term um prediction problems might if it became widely accepted force people to think more in terms of probabilities and disincentivize people for just telling compelling stories rather than getting it right um, or or you could try to zoom in more narrowly on some specific existential risks or particular technologies. You can work on AI safety or you can work on hu in genetic enhancement of humans or you can work on some other particular methodologies. So if somebody is actually interested in doing as much good as possible, there are a variety of different paths one could take. So one would just be to try to make a lot of money and then donate it to the right uh, causes, which for many people might be the most cost effective way of contributing. Um, some people might uh, uh, contribute directly through their work. For instance, in academia, there is a lot of important research questions that one could work on. And it's not obvious what the, the most important discipline to study. I think that will depend maybe on, on the particular the person's talents and natural interest. If one looks at the people who are working on these things right now, there are a number of different disciplines uh, that have produced useful contributors. So uh, some significant number come from philosophy, some significant number from computer science, some from uh, mathematics. Uh, those might be the three most common fields. But also some from economics and neuroscience and physics. And, and, and there might be yet other fields that have the potential to produce uh, really useful contributors. I think it, uh, another common thing, if one just looks at the people who are involved in this, is that they have often, even if they have a degree in one field, they, have, they know more, they have kind of wide interest. Um, so, um, so that's something that one could do. Then, then a whole host of other people, like journalists, would be in a potential to Sort of spread awareness of these things funding agencies and people who work for those will have other opportunities for influence political leadership opinion leaders so there's a whole swath of different ways that you could contribute um and which which way to contribute will depend on what what your circumstances are your talents like um but um, um but but for some people just what seems like the most boring way might actually be the best way which is just to take advantage of the um, 
the principle of division of labor and uh, earn money using whatever skills you have and then donate some fraction of that to other people who are specializing in doing the kind of work that needs to be done. So I think that transhumanism during the, especially during the 90s, played a very important role in creating a, a forum where where these ideas could be explored. This was in conferences and an internet mailing list and and a lot of these really sort of advanced issues about the long-term impact of technology with nanotechnologies, space colonization, AI, human enhancement were at at least at that point in time almost exclusively discussed in this transhumanist forum and certainly the discussion was more advanced there than anywhere else. Um, I think that's like a great contribution that transhumanism has, has made uh, to the world. And I, I think it still has the potential to continue that um, awareness spreading uh, role. Um, if I were to make some criticism, I think that there's been a tendency uh, among some transhumanists to feel that it was their obligation to be the cheerleaders of technological change and to defend any and all forms of technological change against any and all forms of objections and criticism. I think that's unnecessary. It's just like a burden that we can just lift off of our shoulder and drop. There is no reason to feel that one has to defend all forms of technological change. Uh, like just stop doing it and you will feel relieved that you no longer have to try to make that argument. Um, you can still emphasize the, the great potential if technology is developed and used wisely and fairly that there's just this enormous space of possible possible modes of being that that human life can become something far greater than than what we know and that ultimately technology is needed to realize that potential i think that's the core of the transhumanist situation but that's consistent with there being huge risks and the there being the possibility of technology being used for huge evil and it being the case that current technologies often don't work very well and that you should be skeptical of just popping a lot of pills and hoping that, you know, you will uh, derive great benefits from that. So it's consistent to have this ultimately very optimistic view about what can happen if everything goes right and that technology has a big part in that. And at the same time, being skeptical of with, about what technology can do now and, and about what the, the risks that, that we will confront in actually realizing this immense goal. But, but keeping that vision in life of what's ultimately possible, um, I think is an important component here among all this talk of, of risk and downside. Um, back in 1998, I founded this World Transhumanist Association with David Pierce. And the reason was to... Uh, there were a couple of reasons. So one was to create a platform that could sort of cater to a wide range of different forms of transhumanism, because some of the basic transhumanist ideas can be combined with political views from from left and from the right and from the middle and apolitical views. And it seemed useful to have a sort of a, a more broad ranging uh, form of transhumanism than, than extropianism, which was a kind of uh, the thing that existed before that. Um, Another was to try to bring into the mainstream, in particular the academic mainstream, some of these issues about human enhancement and enhancement ethics, um, and just try to encourage a wider public uh, discussion about these things and awareness that the human condition as we know it is not an eternally given constant. It's not a fixed parameter. It's something that probably will change over the coming decades. And you need to really take that into account if you want to have some serious view about where we should be going, what, 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 what we should be hoping for in the world. And I think that, at least in those two respects, the World Transhumanist Association has actually been a success. It is now the case uh, that in bioethics, for instance, there are books, seminars, papers published all the time on human enhancement ethics, it has entered the mainstream. And I think that if you asked many sort of educated people or in intellectual leaders, what, what 
about their vision for the future that, that there's a greater fraction of them at least would take into account the possibility of fundamental technological changes to human nature than, than was the case 10 years ago. I still think there is a lot, uh, a lot further to go in that respect, obviously. Um, but, but in so far as, as transhumanism can continue to serve that role of, of raising awareness, bringing these topics into the, the center of attention and getting people to widen their horizon and thinking of the human condition not as an eternally given, but something that perhaps can change and will change. Uh, that that's a very important um, value that transhumanism brings to the world, in, in addition to sort of being an actual kind of social community for, for the people who are actively engaged themselves. <laughs>